What's up guys, Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House. And my guest today is Dr. Anna Lemke, the Medical Director of Addiction Medicine at Stanford University, the Chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic, and the author of Dopamine Nation. And this conversation was wild. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Now, we got into all kinds of things. First of all, starting with uh, trends in addiction. You know, we've moved from a place of dominant substance abuse as how we understand addiction into a place where behavioral addictions are on this massive spike and trajectory. And we got into why and what those what that means, right? What is a behavioral addiction? And what does that look like in our society? You know, obviously, one place that we ended up on the back of this conversation was tech adoption our addiction to things like social media and smartphones where does that go as we migrate to more involvement in worlds like the metaverse and what's the outcome there personally i'm terrified of this and so i was uh privileged to get to uh put dr lemke on the spot today and ask her opinion you know she's front and center as a professor um at stanford you know and and, and the author of a best-selling book on dopamine addiction which is really what this is all about but you know, really, really fascinating. Um, we talked about whether our tech lords are any different from drug lords of the past or present. And in my opinion, I don't really think they are. And I get into why, but so this may be a little bit controversial, but super, super fun. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Three things before we begin this conversation. Number one, <clears throat> this channel now uh, generates significant ad revenue, which is rad. I didn't expect that. What I've decided to do with that cash is donate it to an organization that's super close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by giving at-risk youth the opportunity to relocate to uh, beautiful wilderness environments and then support them with housing and, and career training and supportive positive influences in their life. I love what they do, so check out Zero Ceiling if you're interested. Number two, right beneath this video, there's a pinned comment where you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter where I share my key takeaways from conversations just like this and, and plenty others. And number three, if you prefer to listen to my content as opposed to watch it, you can find me wherever you listen to your podcast. Just search for The Jay Martin Show. Here's Dr. Anna Lemke, enjoy. I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. What's up guys? Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House and I'm joined today by Dr. Anna Lemke, the Medical Director of Addiction Medicine at Stanford University, Chief of the Stanford Addiction and Medicine Dual Diagnos Diagnosis Clinic, and author of Dopamine Nation. Anna, it's uh, great to have you on the show. So thanks so much for chatting with me today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Could we start with um, maybe Dopamine Nation? And I'd love you to just introduce the subject matter in the book and what prompted you to write it, what inspired you to write this book? Sure. So I'll start with what inspired me. Um, I've been practicing psychiatry for more than 20 years, and I started seeing more and more patients coming in addicted, not just to drugs like alcohol, cocaine, cannabis, but also increasingly addicted to behaviors like gambling, pornography, shopping, and then video games, social media, and smartphones, and all that that entails. And I also found myself um, developing a, an attachment to reading a certain genre of book that uh, was very much like the kinds of addictive behaviors that I was seeing in my patients. Hmm. So I decided to write about that phenomenon, the growing problem of addiction in the modern world, the neuroscience behind it, and also what we can do about it. And I specifically hold up my patients in recovery from severe addictions as modern day prophets for the rest of us, because if people who are most vulnerable to this problem of addiction can navigate our world of overabundance, then it occurred to me that they would have important lessons for the rest of us. So the book is ultimately about trying to help people. Um, and it acknowledges that we are in a very challenging and unprecedented time in human existence, but it's challenging in counterintuitive ways, which is to say that the most challenging aspect about it is that we have too much of everything. Um, rather than that we do not don't have enough of the things uh, that we need to survive and maintain our lives. We are lacking in some of the intangibles um, that um, will give us a feeling of meaning and purpose and reward separate from the things that we consume. 
And so that that's kind of what the book is about. So, you know, what struck me is you focused a lot on behavioral addictions. When we say the word addiction, often we think about substance abuse, right? But behavioral behavior addictions are clearly on some massive trajectory spike in cases, right? And so if I heard you correctly, like we're, we're trying to operate in a system that we weren't built for, right? And, and that challenges our primal instincts. It challenges our, what we may consider instincts or intuition, how we would navigate the world. We're in a foreign environment, right? One that we weren't built for, our biology was not built for. And so we're trying to make sense of this foreign environment that's evolved far faster than our minds and our, our instincts have. So talk to me a little bit more about that, about the challenge of overabundance. And then when you say we're, we're surrounded by an abundance of so many things, but actually lacking in some, some of the intangibles. And I immediately am like, you mean like love and connection? Like what, what are the intangibles that we're lacking and how does that dynamic play? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, let's see where to start. First of all, behavioral addictions, otherwise known as process addictions, are addictions to behaviors rather than substances that we ingest into our body. And um, not all behavioral addictions are recognized as true addictions. For example, only gambling addiction is included in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, um, which is sort of the, the Bible or compendium for how we diagnose addictions. But there is growing consensus that people can, in fact, get addicted to things like pornography, compulsive masturbation, things like social media, things like video games, food is increasingly reconceptualized as a, a potential form of addiction, bulimia nervosa, that binge purge pattern is increasingly seen as something that is akin to addiction and many, many other um, compulsive behaviors that we engage in. I think the best way to um, understand the ways in which our primitive wiring is mismatched for the modern world is to talk a little bit about some of the advances in, neuro in the neuroscience of pain and pleasure um, that we've discovered in the past 75 years or so. So one of the most interesting findings is that pain and pleasure are co-located co in the brain. So the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain, and they work like opposite sides of a balance. So when we do something pleasurable, our balance tips one way. When we experience pain, it tips the other. So for example, if I do something that's pleasurable for me, like eat a piece of chocolate, I get a little release of dopamine, the brain's reward neurotransmitter in a specific circuit of the brain called the reward pathway, and my balance tilts to the side of pleasure. But one of the overarching rules governing that balance is that it wants to remain level or what neuroscientists call homeostasis. It doesn't want to be tipped for very long to pleasure or pain. And our brains will indeed work very hard to restore a level balance. So when we get that little release of dopamine or in the case of highly addictive substances and behaviors, a great big release of dopamine in the reward pathway, our brain responds immediately by downregulating our own dopamine transmission and production, but not just to baseline levels, actually below baseline levels okay. before, before coming to a level balance. And I imagine this as these neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again, but they stay on until we're tipped an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That's the come down, the hangover, that moment of wanting one more piece of chocolate. But if we wait long enough, they hop off in homeostasis is restored. So it's fundamental to appreciate that for every pleasure, we pay a price and that price is pain until we restore a level balance. And if we continually bombard our dopamine reward pathway with highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors like what we have in the environment today, mm. Eventually, what happens is that we accumulate so many neuroadaptation gremlins on the pain side of the balance that they fill this whole room, and we end up with a pleasure-pain balance chronically tilted to the side of pain. So we change our hedonic or joy set point. So now we're walking around in a state of constant withdrawal, and the universal system is a withdrawal from any addictive substance or anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, and intrusive craving or wanting to use. Now we need our drug compulsively not to feel good or get high, but just to restore a balance and feel normal. 
our focus and attention has narrowed to acquiring that one substance. We arrange our whole day around it. Mm. And again, when we're not using, we're in the state of a dopamine deficit condition where we are then seeking not to get high, but just to feel normal. So th that's essentially the mismatch, right? We're living in a world where we've increased access, quantity, potency, and novelty of an almost infinite variety of feel-good substances and behaviors in ways large and small. We are constantly bombarding our dopamine reward pathway with these reinforcing substances and behaviors such that I think many of us are now walking around with a pleasure pain balance tilted to the side of pain, which explains the increasing rates of depression, anxiety, suicidality, and addiction that we're seeing all over the world, especially in rich countries. Okay. That there's so much there that I want to pull on. So, um, I, I understand that the balance you described, you know, when we experience pleasure, we, we are rewarded with pain because we need to achieve that homeostasis, that equilibrium again. Right. And so we, it's not enough just for us to fall back to normal. We actually have to make up for the deficit or the surplus that we created. Right. So we have That's to right. dip into the other. And similarly, therefore, if we, maybe this isn't a blanket rule, but if we experience some pain, we're rewarded with some pleasure. That's and, that right. is, and that is, you know, something that I want to talk about with you because, you know, pain for pleasure versus pleasure for pain. I love the pain for pleasure mm -hmm. um, world, you know, and, and I talk about all the time on the show, like the importance of being comfortable in discomfort, which in itself can be an addiction, right? Like I, yeah. I crave, I have a cedar barrel sauna and a cold plunge, an ice bath in my backyard, mm -hmm. and I need it at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. And it's hard to sit in the sauna for the 35 minutes. It's uncomfortable. Then we get in the ice bath and that's worse. But afterwards, you feel this like euphoria, right? Yeah. So, you know, there, there's a lot in there because, you know, you could say I'm addicted to that, but is that a healthy mm -hmm. addiction, right? And, and I want to talk about that with you. But before we get there, I don't want to distract myself because... You know, you said today many people are walking around with their their balance tilted towards pain, right? Mm -hmm. And so that has to come, if I understand what you said correctly, from a chronic addiction to the cheap thrill pleasure, right? So that's right. For us to be chronically in pain, we need to be simultaneously chronically seeking some cheap thrill pleasure. Is that correct? So, so let me interrupt you there because this is the part that's a little counterintuitive. It feels like being in pain is what drives seeking these cheap rewards or this quick dopamine. But what I'm trying to communicate is it's the in indulgence in the quick reward that actually leads to the dysphoria, anxiety, restlessness, the balance tilted here. Again, with repeated exposure to a similar, uh, to the same or similar rewarding stimulus, that initial response gets weaker and shorter, but that after response to the side of pain gets stronger and longer. In other words, the balance remembers, and those gremlins once formed, although they hop off, they're waiting in the wings to hop on again. And the more we use a substance, the more gremlins will hop on because that opponent process effect is stronger and longer with repeated use. So we end up in this dopamine deficit state because we have overindulged in dopamine in the first place. Okay. But it feels subjectively like, oh, I feel depressed and anxious. I'm going to reach for some weed because it's going to take those feelings away. And indeed, it will in the short term relieve those feelings by restoring homeostasis, but it will add one more gremlin to the pain side and ultimately make the anxiety, depression, restlessness poor concentration, whatever it is, worse over the long run. That's the counterintuitive piece. Right. Because often we'll feel shitty. We'll feel like, you know, I feel down in the dumps, depressed. Right. So I'll reach for something that I know will make me feel better. Mm -hmm. Whatever is accessible to me, right? Like if you have the, the foresight and the discipline, maybe you understand in order to, to, you know, if I feel depressed personally, I understand I need to go and do something hard. Right. Like go yeah. get a really challenging workout in, mm -hmm. um, go sit still for a 25 minute meditation can be really hard. Hop in my sauna, whatever that is. But if I do something really hard and challenging, it's amazing how it, it you know, that's counterintuitive. I feel challenged. Right. So if I do something challenging, I'll feel better, but it works. Right. Right. So that, that is the central message of dopamine nation. If you feel bad, instead of reaching for something to comfort yourself, 
do something hard mm. because by pressing on the pain side, what will happen is the brain will adapt to that by starting to upregulate its own feel good hormones and neurotransmitters. And we can see that, for example, an experiment was done where adult males were immersed in an ice cold water bath for an hour and dopamine levels as well as serotonin and norepinephrine levels were, were tracked while they were in the bath and afterwards. Okay. And what was shown was that dopamine levels rose consistently through the course of that one hour ice cold water bath and remained elevated for hours afterwards. So think about that trajectory. You get a slow increase through the course of the painful, presumably painful ice cold water bath. And then after you get out of the bath, your dopamine levels remain elevated for several hours before going down to baseline. Now contrast that with something that's immediately reinforcing and works very quickly, which gives us a spike of dopamine followed by a plummet in dopamine levels below baseline, that dopamine deficit state and an eventual return to baseline levels. That's a very different graphic trajectory. And I would, I would suggest, and it sounds like you, have, you intuitively figured this out, that it's much better to get your dopamine indirectly by having the initial stimulus be a painful one. And it doesn't have to be just a physically painful one, but the classic ones are exercise and other um, kinds of sensory, painful sensory stimuli. But it can also be, you know, a challenging cognitive experience. It can be a challenging emotional experience. In this day and age, it can be just unplugging for a while and sitting in silence because um, mm. it's seldom, you know, that we're even doing that. We're constantly listening to music or watching things, um, constantly distracting ourselves. Right. And I, you know, I wouldn't say intuitively, but definitely through trial and error. Maybe I've there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, you got the point is though that you got you got there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause I'm familiar with the other side too. I I'm sober yeah. six years now. So, okay. Congratulations. Uh, you know, so, so let's walk through why people today mm -hmm. might be operating in this deficit. And, you know, the obvious I want to point to is like, this is the accessible dopamine hit, right? Yeah. It's available to us at any point in time in our pocket. And, you know, if, if, if you're feeling a bit, whatever, you know, uh, depressed or just, um, frustrated, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. an easy distraction and it's right there, right? You can right. peek into something that gives you a bit of a hit. Right. So, you know, I think we, we, we all understand the impact of social media addiction, right? Um, but sometimes it just helps to hear it again and again and again, until we really thoroughly integrate that lesson into our life. And so I'd love you to touch on that right now. Let's assume that this is the, the criminal in the room when it comes to putting <laughs> us in this state of, of chronic, uh, pain and, yeah. and walk me through what you're seeing today. What's, what's, what's the core issue with this and, and how right. can, how can we understand it better? I think the first thing is just to validate that human connection is fundamentally a good thing. It's, it's a positive. And it's furthermore something that we've evolved over millions of years to do to make those human connections, right? To be part of a tribe. When we're part of a tribe, we are able to protect ourselves from predators, to shepherd scarce resources, to find a mate, to procreate. So those are all things that are highly um, conserved, you know, evolved over millions of years and really hardwired. One of the ways that our brains get us to make human connections is actually to release dopamine when we make that connection as signaled by when people like us, when people praise us, um, when people share um, a secret with us, when, um, when people experience the same emotion at the same time as when we experience that emotion. So communal emotions, um, those are all powerful um, drivers of the release of that feel-good hormone dopamine. My colleague, Rob Malenka has recently shown that oxytocin, which is our love hormone um, released in pair bonding, in nursing dyads, um, that oxytocin actually binds to dopamine releasing hormones in the reward pathway and causes the release of dopamine. So that whole dopamine system and the love system and, and the connection system, it's all intertwined. But what the smartphone has done and what social media has done is potentially, not always, but potentially turned human connection into a drug by making it 
um, more accessible. So, I mean, if you think about, you know, how, how historically we made human connections, well, first of all, you had to go out and find the people, right? And then the people were on average, you know, average good looking and average intelligent and average interesting, right? Uh, the conversations could be awkward. They required effort. They didn't always work out. Then you had to move on and try something else. And you had to walk pretty far and find another person. Now, contrast that with today, where with this, you know, 24-7 access to the smartphone, you have an infinite number of choice. Um, people have curated profiles. You don't even know if they're real or if they're enhanced. But certainly, you can see a whole world of people out there and find really incredibly beautiful ones and brilliant ones and, and you know, what have you. The, the quantity is, is endless. Um, the novelty is endless. So, so access, quantity, novelty, potency, mm. you know, made more potent by uh, vivid images combined with music. <clears throat> the way that we give things a number makes them highly, highly uh, addictive in, in ways that we don't fully understand. But when we enumerate things, that's very reinforcing. So number of likes, number of tweets or retweets, our rankings on whatever you know leaderboard we happen to be paying attention to. All of those things are things that hook us and take something that's fundamentally healthy and adaptive, which is our need and desire to connect with other people, and turns it into a drug. Okay, now I, I, because when I hear you say that, I'm like, yes, all of this is is built to prey on a core human need that we have, which is the need for significance, right? Like we all crave that in our life. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's important. I think that is a primal instinct. Um, I want to run an idea past you, and because you're very close to this, and you're watching a lot of the, you know, a lot of the human behavior that comes the consequence of our integration with tech, and. <clears throat> You know, what strikes me right now as a bit of a concern is that, I don't have a concern, it's just, it is what it is. You know, a lot of the, the most influential tech personalities in the Silicon Valley have their children in very low tech schools, right? Waldorf, for example, has blown up through California as a consequence of all the professionals in tech that want their kids in low tech schools. Right. And, and you can get kind of dark with this and say like, there's a lot of weird parallels between you know, uh, Pablo Escobar built a drug empire, never touching the drug he sold, right? He was the dealer, not the user, right? Mm -hmm. And you can draw parallels between our, our, our big tech overlords, right? Being the dealers and the population being the users, mm -hmm. um, you know, simultaneously recognizing that those who are distributing the product understand the dangers of it and keep their family from it, right? right. Mm -hmm. Now, wh what does that, how does that speak to you? Do you, do you mm -hmm. think about that? And what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that gets to the heart of the dark side of capitalism. You know, capitalism is this wonderful way to enhance some of the best qualities of human nature, you know, our drive to succeed, um, our, our desire for excellence, uh, you know, our work ethic, all of those things are really put to very good use through a capitalist system. But ultimately, at the end of the day, capitalism is exploitative um, in the sense that, you know, the consumer is sort of the end user and the person who makes the product for consumption is the sort of king of the mountain. Um, without consumers, there would be no kings. Uh, without kings, there would be no consumers. And so, um, you know, unbridled capitalism is, is a pretty scary thing um, in that, you know, ultimately it does create slaves. Now, they're not slaves, you know, in a legal sense, but they're certainly slaves to, um, you know, our neurological hardwired tendency to uh, want to approach pleasure and avoid pain and, you um, the typical human being will engage in that without seeing it as it's happening. And some, some of us will get very caught up in that, that, mm. uh, you know, terrible vortex. So. Yeah. And it's hard to understand because, you know, I, I advocate for capitalism and I, yeah. I consider myself a free market capitalist and simultaneously I'm a humanitarian. And, mm -hmm. you know, if we play a game of monopoly, five of us at the end of the game, every time one person ends up with everything, 
right? right. And, and that's just the, 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 the flow of, of uh, competition, I suppose, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was... I was proposed this idea from a guest I had on a show recently, who again is like, you know, he's, he's maybe, maybe in his seventies, life, lifelong, uh, libertarian capitalist, but he came to me and said, you know, there's some things I believe that need to change. One being, if you look at the direction of big tech, is it time for these to be regulated like utilities? And, Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know the answer to that, but I, I came at it from a small business approach. It was like, I run a couple of small businesses. If I, was based in the mid eighties you know, I couldn't run my business without maybe a phone number and a right. physical address. Right? right. Today, that is social media. I need that presence right. in order right. to be competitive and exist, right. To talk right. to my consumers. And so because they're a necessity, therefore, right. should they be regulated like utilities? My gut instinct was like, no, like when has government made things better? But you know, uh maybe this time it's different mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. you know there's never sometimes it's just not a perfect path forward you, you got to right. navigate a challenging a challenging environment and there's going to be uh concessions no matter which direction you go because my bigger concern is like if we don't regulate right what's mm-hmm. the what's the outcome here right we're looking right. at i think the equivalent of digital governments at this point where you've got corporations with larger treasuries than sovereign nations, more mm-hmm. power in terms of data mm-hmm. analytics and the ability to sway public sentiment than sovereign nations. And so at what point, and are we past that point, mm-hmm. where they're more influential than our sovereign governments, right? right. And I, and then what, right? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and then what? So it's, uh, what do you think about what I just said there? Yeah, I mean, I think you're hitting on sort of a, a recurring theme that many of us are circling around this sort of awareness that we've somehow gone off the rails, not sure exactly how to define the ways in which we've gone off the rails or how to bring us back, but sort of growing consensus that something, you know, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Um, you know, for, with a, here's, here's what I worry about a little bit, and, um, you know, as along these lines, I think that people of means, education, and privilege will ultimately figure out that being online 24-7 is toxic to their mental health, their morality, um, their just the condition of being human, and they will get off. Whereas people um, at the lower rent, rungs of the socioeconomic ladder will end up being the ones living in, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse. So I, I think we're going to end up with two classes of people here, those who continue to maintain a foothold in real life and those who are online 24-7 um, and have lost any connection to people in the real world or a real world identity. And, and so my worry is for those individuals, um, those individuals who are most vulnerable to getting lost in the metaverse. Cause I think already what we're seeing is, you know, people realizing, oh, wow, you know, the internet is great for some things, some of the time, as long as I'm, you know, have some degree of control of how I participate in it. Um, and then we're seeing another group of people who are really lost in it. Um, and, and these are the people who are also dying of other diseases related to, um, you know, choices, lifestyle choices that we make um, people, you know, who, I mean, the 70% of the world's global deaths are due to modifiable risk factors. The top three are poor diet, uh, lack mm. of exercise and smoking. So this is right. just sort of an extension of that growing problem. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I agree with you on the, on the, the two worlds outcome here. Right. And I was, I was pushing for a different outcome uh just in conversation with a buddy i said you know maybe maybe hopefully you know because i have three kids as we said you know under the age of six so i'm very conscious of how they will be influenced and even looking critically at our education system you know my five-year-old's now in kindergarten we found a school i'm in a little mountain town like 45 minutes outside of vancouver canada so it's close to the city but it's like this isolated little little mountain town we found this school that's completely outdoors there's actually no right. classroom it's it's called right. nature learners and mm-hmm. and um you know heavy emphasis on free play on on learning about things like cyclicality from watching the environment change around them and they you know go to the river and watch the salmon spawn and all this Beautiful. stuff and yeah 
I love it. Yeah, I love it. Cause I, I was a benefactor of, of the therapeutic, uh, um, ability of the natural environment. And I, yeah, you know, it's such great. a great thing to have access mm -hmm. to if you're fortunate enough to. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> shout out to, uh, one of our, not a, not a sponsor, but a, a organization that we support through this channel called Zero Ceiling. Their mission is to end youth homelessness by taking at risk urban youth and putting them or giving them the opportunity to relocate to a wilderness environment and then surround them with positive influence. And I just wow, love that's what they do. Awesome. I love that. They're yeah. Very cool. So you're, you're, you're exactly getting on the, the thing that, you know, I'm, I'm also alluding to, whereas you know, the, the average public school in the United States has kids on a screen more hours in the day than not, right? And, and much of that time is, is, by my estimation, having had four kids in the public school system, much of it is a waste of time. Mm. Um, so, you know, this is, a, this is really hugely problematic. Um, and I think we have to, as a society, sort of look at not just our lives, but the lives of the most, you know, vulnerable among us and, and figure out how we can all get better access to the types of enduring rewards that are ultimately better for us in the long run. Okay, I got one more question on this, this metaverse uh, scenario that you described. And cause I see it playing out the way you described where maybe children because so I, I was my hope was that my kids will grow up and look at technology the way we've adopted it you know heavy social media interaction migrating towards full spectrum metaverse technologies as my generation looked at cigarettes right yeah. my grandmother was given her first cigarette by her doctor when she was pregnant right this will relax yeah. you right that mm -hmm. was standard practice right mm -hmm. both of and so obviously that's changed and i now look at it like why on earth would you make that decision right mm -hmm. like how could you not have assumed this would be bad for you and my hope is that my kids will grow up and say how could you not have known this would be bad for you mm -hmm. how could you not have known given all your data and movements and activity it would be bad for you right like any right. direction you want to go there right and my, my buddy pushed back with essentially your point and said, yes, those children with positive influences and support systems may see that, see it that way, but some people are going to fall through the cracks, right? Mm -hmm. And, and they'll fall right into that, the seductive, um, competency of technology, which is, I mean, we know how addictive social media on our smartphone can be, you know, just wait till it's wrapped around our, our, our universe, 360 degrees. I mean, I've yeah. tried the Oculus headsets. They're very seductive and very addicting. Mm -hmm. Like they're, mm -hmm. they're fun and exciting. And I, I mm -hmm. get it, you know, I, mm -hmm. which is, is what it is, but, uh, you know, so any advice that, that you've seen, you know, that could help young parents, young kids, whatever steer in, in the best direction and, and try to avoid that, that outcome. Yeah. So I mean, the first thing I say to parents is you should be modeling the behavior that you want your kids to exhibit. If you're constantly on your phone and tell your kids to get off, it's not going to be a very persuasive argument. Secondly, I do believe that children under the age of about 12 should not own their own devices. Mm -hmm. And when they're on a screen, it should be very closely monitored. We cannot give kids unfettered access to the internet and hope that all will be well. It really will most likely not be well. <laughs> I mean, kids as it is have access to so much adult content that would have been, you know, unimaginable uh, for generations past. And, you know, they don't really know what to do with that adult content. So there has to be also lots of discussions of when our kids are exposed to that adult content. We can't freak out. We have to like have reasonable discussions about what they've seen and what it means. But in general, my first order of advice is model the behavior you want to see and do not give your child a device or unfettered access to the internet. And by the way, once they hit about 12, it's not like unfettered access is fine, but my experience has been when they get to be 12, you can't control them anymore. They will go out, get their own devices, be with their friends' devices. So you want to make sure that when they get to that point, you have established a very good foundation for healthy habits and healthy coping skills, healthy sleep, healthy eating, healthy exercise, teaching kids how to be in their body, healthy in real life game playing, in real life negotiating, um, it, you know, human interactions, um, social etiquette, how to say hello, how to say goodbye. But all of these things, they, they seem absurd to have to say, but I can tell you in my practice, I see lots and lots of kids and families where these fundamental norms have been totally obliterated. 
So we really have to reinforce what we either individually as family units or collectively as a society deem to be appropriate digital etiquette. And I'm giving some hints of what I think that would look like. But, you know, obviously it would be a a discussion within a family or, or within a community. I'm not obviously the final arbiter of that. And then when kids do have unfettered access, as they eventually will, you know, hopefully they have, the, you know, that they're armed with the knowledge of brain science, as I talk about in my book, Dopamine Nation. They're, um, they appreciate that it's not just how you feel in the moment, it's the come down and how you feel separating from the screen and all the things on it um, that tells you something about what's going on in your brain. Um, and it's them having established basic coping strategies to live in real life, not just to navigate uh, you know, the metaverse. Yeah. No, that, that 12 years old number that you, that you threw out is like front and center for me right now, because I've been wondering, right, at what age do you as the parent, and this wouldn't be a fixed number, but at what age do you as the parent lose the position mm. as the dominant influence in yes. your child's life? You know, mm. and, and set and setting is going to determine that to a degree, but there's going to be a range. And as the parent of a five-year-old, I'm like, does this mean we're halfway through? Is it 10? Is half of the opportunity already gone? Mm-hmm. And, it, and then it's depreciating, right? Like maybe mm-hmm. up until now, I'm, I'm, you know, 80 to 100% of the influence. I've got a, a right. one-year-old. I'm probably 100%. My wife and I 100% <laughs> of the influence, right? Him and his yeah. brother, me and, me and his brothers. But then, you know, at, at five years old, what's my percentage of influence? Mm-hmm. My, my wife and I, at 10 years old, what's the percentage? And at what point do we fall below 50? Right. Yeah. Well, all of a sudden, the world, right. the heavier influence. Yeah. And, and I would say once kids leave the home and go to school, you're already introducing a whole other world of influence. <clears throat> that's incredibly powerful. But you still have quite a lot of influence and control. But once they get to be 12, 13, it drops below 50 percent. And then they develop lives, not just separate from you, but lives that you have no access to. And I think that's really the crucial bridge. And if you give them, if they're on social media earlier, that comes earlier. And I think it comes inappropriately earlier. Mm. Again, let me emphasize this, not just a life that's separate from you. It's the life that's separate from you and that you have no access to. You do not know what is going on. Mm. So I think that is inevitable by about 12 or 13. I will give our, my, our eldest daughter a case in point. She, she started high school with uh, no internet access to the house and never having had uh, a, a a phone herself. Um, she, I believe she might have had, no, she didn't even have a laptop. She had no device. She started school, high school that way. Within a month, she had a laptop. We had Wi Fi to the house because she couldn't reasonably participate in the school system without those. And she had bought her own phone and her own plan. And from that moment forward, we completely lost control. It doesn't mean we had no mm. influence because we had established a good and trusting relationship with her, but yeah. we didn't really know what she was doing. Yeah. As you, how could you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I think you're, you're right. Like the, who was it? It was Trist, Tristan Harris. So you, you probably know, you know, okay. Well, yeah. I, I, yeah. He were, he and I were in the social dilemma documentary together. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And he um, was recently a guest on Joe Rogan's podcast, as were you. And, yeah. and, and when Tristan was on, he mentioned like subtle changes in various social media platforms. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not on TikTok, or at least I don't think so. My media team is telling me I need to be on TikTok, but I don't, I don't think I am yet. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> don't, don't do it. it. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've, I haven't yet. And if I am, yeah. it's anyways, anyways. Uh, but he said they've, they've done something like added a 2% filter as the, um, uh, as the standard, default, I, right. yeah, the default. Mm-hmm. So there's always a little touch of filtering to make everybody just two percent better looking on the platform right. Right. to to feed that again back to that like attraction of the platform and life's right. better here and all of this mm-hmm. right and mm-hmm. and all that which is which is horrifying. Um, and again, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, yeah. You know, it was interesting. I um, was recently on a Chinese national news program because. China just implemented a federal regulation where children under the age of 18 are not allowed to play video games more than two hours a week, approximately. And they're they're holding the video game companies accountable for uh, enforcing that, including facial recognition software, special ID, of course, 
you know, there'll be some 20% of kids who are going to circumvent that. There already are buying adults IDs and finding some way to get around the facial recognition software. But what I'm getting to is that um, there was a Chinese official, um, a representative of the government on the program with me um, discussing this new change in Chinese law. And I asked her, well, you know, I, I, I'm sure that parents across China are thrilled. I know I would be, um, you know, if there were something, we, this would never happen in the United States, but I would welcome it. Um, but I said, but why just video games? I mean, why not TikTok? Why not pornography? Um, so it's, it's, and of course, TikTok is a Chinese product. So right. um, they might be much more reluctant. So there you have that, again, that tension between what is actually good for us and what is profitable for us. And that tension is always going to be there. Um, yeah. you know, in our capitalist system. That's such a struggle for me because I, I completely agree. When I heard about that regulation as a parent, I'm like, you're Great. doing the right thing. You're doing <laughs> yeah. the right thing, right? Like we've, con we've created a beast that we don't yeah. know how to control and we, we need to, for the sake of the next generation. Right. right. Uh, again, some interesting data points Tristan shared on that podcast was so there's a Chinese version of TikTok, and I'm not super familiar with what that is, but in the scroll algorithm, right? First of all, there's breaks every few minutes, a little pop-up says, would you like to take a break? So it uh -huh. breaks up the continuous scroll mm -hmm. uh, reaction, mm -hmm. right? Uh, maybe putting somebody off of the platform, but secondly, it feeds intentional content focused on engineering, science, and government propaganda. But, you know, it's, it's trying to feed positive influence right that will steer a generation into, uh, I guess, productive endeavors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's easy to look at that and be like, that's authoritarian terror, right? Like that's, you're, you know, and I agree with that, but simultaneously, I agree that the path that we're on isn't any better, right? It's not, right? It's, it's I don't know, it's, it's worse. I mean, you, right? you only have to survey parents, you know, in, in the West to appreciate the extent to which parents are in distress. Yeah. Um, and unable, and even if you, you know, create the perfect home environment, your kids go to school, at least most schools, not, not the mountain school, but most schools and, and, you know, they're on their screens all day or all those in between times. I mean, I don't think parents alone can be expected to police and manage this problem when it comes to young people. And I think we would all agree that, you know, children are a vulnerable population. We can't treat children the same as we treat adults who, for whom it, you know, we can say, well, freedom of choice and people need to be able to decide for themselves how they spend their, their consumptive time. Yeah. And again, it's, it's, it's one of those things. I think we're going to really have to challenge what we're willing to accept. Well, people like me, maybe, or anybody, I mean, because the, the path forward is, is I think impossible without massive concessions about what we really, really wanted, right. And what we wanted this to be and what it's become, you know, and, right. And we're in uncharted territory and there's a lot of uh, dystopian outcomes, but I will bet all day long on human ingenuity. And I'm an optimist, like, you know, you can't, I am, you know, to a fault. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm long humans, but, but it's, it's a very uncertain road ahead. And I think it's going to come with just unexpected concessions that we're going to have to wrap our minds around in order to find that outcome that we, we truly want. Now, yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. And I would just add that, that, but part of the equation has to be the appreciation of the inherent addictive nature of these online products yeah, and the ways in which they really do hijack our motivational neurocircuitry in ways that can make it literally out of our control, um, whether or not we choose or you know, choose to continue or stop consuming a given product. And I think that that's the piece that, you know, it really is important to understand. Yeah. Okay. I agree. And to your point earlier about modeling that behavior, you know, is, is clutch because kids will 100% fail to do what you tell them and 100% succeed at doing what you do. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's a fact, I, I right? Believe that. I believe that. Yeah. So therefore, you know, for, for me anyways, you know, getting my kids out camping, you know, comfortable getting dirty in the dirt, right? Like right. jumping in rivers, being wild animals. So at least they know that exists too, you know, right. that that's there for them when and if they want to call on it, you know, it's right. not foreign and distant and misunderstood. It's available. It's accessible, right? right? Mm -hmm. The natural environment. And maybe, you know, the novelty of that becomes mm -hmm. so exciting compared to the 
mundane repetition of our our our, our tech worlds, right? I don't know. I mean, that's yeah. I, I mean, I think you're you're you know you're pointing out something really important to basic human psychology, which is that our experiences become an encyclopedia of things that we can turn back to at various points in our lives mm. and, and say, oh, uh, I'm, I'm experiencing this now, but I remember when I was doing X and I felt this way. And, and that's really, really important. Without that, people don't know where to turn or what might be an option for them other than what they're doing in, in the present moment. Yeah, that's like sort of managing your own availability bias, right? Like right. Put, putting those thoughts and experiences in your encyclopedia. I love that. That's right. you, you have them to draw on. Yeah. Right. Which is why one of the main things that I recommend in Dopamine Nation is a 30-day period of abstinence from our drug of choice, even mm. just as a way of exploring whether or not we have become addicted as a way of sort of seeing what is the true impact of my engagement with this particular social media app, for example, in my life, it feels like it's the only thing that gives me comfort and joy. But could it be that I'm not seeing it clearly? And I really do think that period of abstinence away from it um, is a way to get that insight. And then again, becomes a touchstone for comparison, so that we can make informed choices going forward. Yeah, it makes me think of... um... I recently interviewed Dave Asprey. He's a he's a biohacker, and you might know he was endorsing the idea of fasting from everything, right? Mm, for a, mm-hmm. ter- you know a certain amount of time, and right. you know whether that's fasting from technology, fasting from food, fasting from hate, a big one that he's mm-hmm. focused on, fasting from air, which sounds crazy, but a <laughs> breathing a breathing practice that he does, you know, is uh-huh. you know the exhale and the you know two to three minute breath hold and uh-huh. but everything right just to determine exactly like where am I where am I standing on this right how reliant right. am I on this right mm-hmm. yeah um, yeah and uh, so there, there's one other direction I want to go with you here you know we we talked about the earlier adoption of tech with our children and how that's influencing their outcomes there's some some trends that sort of complement that that we're seeing like a decrease in free play right and unsupervised free play in children um an increase at time spent at home time spent with parents time spent doing homework i mean the amount of homework the kids get is up like 145 percent in the last 15 20 years and you know you're the professor you can correct me if i'm mm. way off base I, I've there i've heard those things yeah i don't know my kids seem to have less homework than i had when i was <laughs> maybe okay. they're just not doing it <laughs> yeah. right 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 but you know so i'm reading this book right now called the coddling of the american mind have oh, you yeah. read that yep mm-hmm. Okay, so I mean, you have a front row seat to this, right? I'm an outsider trying to understand something, but you know, you're at Stanford. And so, you know, what can you tell me about the trends towards safetyism? And then maybe for somebody who's completely unfamiliar, what am I talking about when I say safetyism? Yeah, well, it's always hard to generalize, you know, large groups or even generations. Um, But I do think that at least in my professional lifetime, and I've been here at Stanford for going on 30 years, if you include my medical school education, there has been a real shift, both in terms of um, young people's expectations of themselves and their lives, and also um, what they're willing and able to tolerate in terms of um, challenges or hardships. And this is paradoxical in and of itself. It seems like expectations have ratcheted up. So when I went to medical school, you know, we were all just looking to be good doctors. Now, these folks who come through, I mean, on the one hand, you could applaud their ambition. On the other hand, it just seems overweening that, you know, being a doctor is not enough. They have to start a company or write their great American novel or, you know, start a nonprofit or, you know, invent, invent some incredible, innovative technology. It just all seems so um, exaggerated. And at the same time, they're often very intolerant of any kind of burden placed upon them, especially as regards to sort of basic civic duty. So it's a very strange combination, um, but, but it's not all that surprising when you think about the influence of the internet and social media. I mean, we were, you know, for most of human history, we've compared ourselves to our siblings, our immediate neighbors, people at school. Now these folks are comparing themselves to the whole world, right? And that does engender a kind of learned helplessness because 
no matter where you look, you're always going to find people who appear to be smarter, more beautiful, more accomplished, richer, mm. and everybody's going to end up feeling less than. And so I think that does, mm. does then drive this sense that it's not enough for me just to be a good doctor. I now need to be a good doctor plus these 20 other things. Um, and then, of course, you know, the extent to which we just over the last, I would say, 30 years, been just terrified of letting anybody experience any kind of psychological pain for fear that it will set them up for future pain. Right. Um, and so trying to just, you know, ease the passage, which I think it's unfortunately um, probably done the, you know, the, the generations of the last 30 years, a great disservice because now they don't trust in themselves to be able to handle adversity because they ha haven't really had to face it. Yeah, it's like the fragility versus anti-fragility mindset, right? Does I mean, it's not to say that everything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but right. a lot of it does, right? Yeah, and, right? And and learning how to cope with that and restricting people from the opportunity to become challenged and uncomfortable uh, is is a uh, is yeah, it's, it's got to have negative implications. You know, it's funny your your comment about when you said less than, right? We're surrounded now by the world. We're competing on a global scale, so therefore, people are smarter, richer, more accomplished. Blah blah blah. You know, and I I deal with this personally all the time, and it's like this constant mindset of just being unsettled with where I'm at, right? And I set pretty audacious goals in my life, and. You know, I talk about this with, I'm in this organization called the Entrepreneur Organization. It's just a global network of business owners who have achieved a certain milestone. And then we, we share, it's like, it's like therapy for the most unemployable people in the world. That's what I really <laughs> call it. What is an entrepreneur really, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but we talk about this constant state of dissatisfaction with where you're at. You can set this, mm -hmm. this goal that when you set it is so inspiring and you're like, when I hit that, like, mm -hmm. I'm going to celebrate, right? Because mm -hmm. that's a huge win. Right. But you, you work and you grind and you get there and you mm -hmm. accomplish and for 20 minutes you feel great. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, you're focused on what is next, what you haven't right. done yet. Right? right and i've actually like even done a bit of therapy on this because i was like what is what is with this mm -hmm. right like how come we can't just be satisfied mm -hmm. and i got a couple answers back you know it was it was interesting but one of them honestly was not what i was expecting it was look like you know you may not enjoy this mm -hmm. but look at your life it's also serving you remarkably well to be uncomfortable with where you're at mm -hmm. you know in terms of like building out like you know, financial stability, for example, mm -hmm. right? Like owning a home, whatever those things are that I feel like are really important that aren't just materialistic, but they're foundational mm -hmm. to the the life I want to, you know, provide for my family. And mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, you may not like this, but it's serving you right now. So you got to keep mm -hmm. it for a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> what do you think? I mean, well, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think I quite agree with that response. I think that the, the real answer here is to find a way to have meaning and joy in the process separate from the outcome. Um, and when you can do that, and also, frankly, anticipate that when you reach your goal, it will be a disappointment because it always is, um, that, that that will help probably more than anything else. So that there has to be some sort of, um, I think, underlying virtue or morality or meaning behind the daily work that supports it separate from the outcome. If you have that, then, you know, the outcome is less important and the disappointment of achievement um, is less disappointing. Mm. I like that. You know, there's, I saw this quote recently that said, there's this misunderstanding that the definition of grit is work without passion, right? Mm. And, and that's leading people astray a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. value to suffering, but suffering without value is, is a, a waste of your life. And Right. And you want to make sure that the value isn't necessarily only in, in the outcome. I mean, that's really the key to, that there has to be value. There must be something in your process, you know, separate from the outcome that is that you enjoy or that's part of you or that feels worthwhile or meaningful, even if it's something along the lines of I'm supporting my family or I'm putting away from my children's education. 
I'm creating a safe and secure environment for the people I love. Um, so I think those are sort of the meta meanings. Of course, the word meta has now been permanently <laughs> um, adulterated, but those are sort of the meta meanings that I look for because those are the drivers that I think ground us in like our connected being to our lives and other people in a way that I think makes us feel more real and um, is more psychologically fulfilling okay. than just this constantly, you know, chasing rainbows. Yeah. Okay. Now how, how are you for time? Can I open up one more little bucket? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We're good. All yeah. right. I think so. Let me see. <laughs> yeah, you let me know. Um, yeah, no, uh, that's fine. I'm good. You're good. All right. So, so I want to, I want to pull on one thread here. We talked about sort of the concept of safetyism and, you know, how I heard you describe it back to me was that we've come to a place where we feel the need to protect students from triggering ideas or trauma because it may create more trauma in the future. Or if we present them with a, a piece of literature that creates that, that in, includes some, uh, some traumatic content relating to a trauma they might have gone through, it'll trigger them to experience more trauma in the future, right? Which is kind of backwards in terms of basic psychology as I understand it, right? You actually want to expose people that have been through traumatic experiences to um, degrees of trauma in order to help them process it and deal with it, all of this. You know, a core concern that I have right now in, in my community and as I just sort of navigate my way through the world is our increasing inability to accept opinions that differ from ours, right? And we're seeing just deeper and deeper social divisions, opposing points of view that's resulting in like more defined tribalism, if you want to call it that, but you know, battle lines are being drawn and you're, you're this or you're that, which, you know, what I enjoyed so much about this conversation is how we've removed the binary nature of so much of this, right? Like is capitalism good or bad? Well, I would say good, but mm -hmm. you know, and you might say this, but you know, or whatever, but like, I think, you know, a core, a core uh, 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 endeavor for us has to be to remove the, the binary assumptions of almost anything, right? Because right. we're really good at putting things in boxes, but that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that's where they live. Yeah. So, you know, what's the relationship between safetyism as it's arrived on campuses, the uh, intention to protect and there's like a whole another thing here if we talk about the corporatization of universities right and mm -hmm. and the the inflated administration staff compared to the amount of faculty that have been onboarded and that's a consequence now you got to meet your bottom line and so you mm. increase tuition fees and and if you know the 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 students or the consumers paying the bills then you end up in this environment where the customer's always right and if the students don't want to be exposed to ideas that counter theirs then we just won't give it to them because we need to right. keep this business afloat right and and that gets really dangerous if university is supposed mm -hmm. to be a place where you go to have your assumptions challenged right and have your yourself sort of carved out of the, the piece of stone that you came in as um now i guess okay so what's the question here it's like you know what's the trajectory that we're on in terms of and is this a, a normal human cycle of some kind or do you see division and conflicts just continuing to to increase and and just become unnavigable in into a place where you know there's a conversation in this echo chamber and a conversation in that echo chamber and we're just we're just going to stop talking like where does this go i guess is from your perspective <laughs> yeah well i mean i i don't know the answer but i think one of the things that we often fail to appreciate with this whole divide is that at the end of the day it's not really about ideas as much as it is about emotion and wanting to belong to a group and the need for community, which we had talked about earlier. And I think that is really what's going on here, that people want to belong to a group. And if they find a group that, you know, accepts them and the ideas in that group resonate with them, um, it's the belonging that becomes the biggest factor in then how they confront ideas that are different from the ideas in that group. It's, and that's where we're, we're in trouble. It's that, that people have now staked their claim, you know, their identity, their values, their, their reason for being on a certain bucket of, of ideas as espoused by a certain group. 
And then you get that difficult circumstance where then if there's something that arises in the group that they actually disagree with, they won't, they won't speak out because they are so afraid of then being shunned from that group, right? The whole camp. So you get this kind of vicious cycle where people get sort of um, worked into having to espouse ideas that they don't even really agree with or believe, but to express, you know, otherwise would be to risk shunning. And I think that's Mm. really, you know, what's going on here. And I think the answer to that is that how can people find identity and meaning and community without feeling that they need to, you know, espouse ideas that they don't really believe in um, and, and being afraid really to express themselves, honestly. Yeah. Um, and I don't know quite what the answer to that is, but it's very clear that, uh, you know, that these identity politics have driven people to a place where they're not even really actually saying what they really think. They're just, um, you know, paying their dues at their club protecting their membership to the community, yeah, right? right? As identity politics, then we get into these deeper and deeper divisions. It becomes a, uh, you're with us or you're against us. That's right. Mindset, That's right? right? Mm-hmm. And so you're, you're with us if you're saying what we're saying, but if you're not, you're obviously against us. Right. And, then, right. and then what happens if you, you, right. you're not part of this team or that team, you're just out in the wilderness by yourself. And that's yeah. terrifying. Yeah. And I think the other Part the other piece here is that again, in, in large part due to our dopamine nation and our our the ways in which we've all become used to instant gratification, people have lost the ability to sit with uncertainty or not knowing or the discomfort of disagreement um, or or even the skills of you know civil debate. So, and that's, I think, part and parcel of sort of this instant gratification of this where people want the answer right away. They want to be black and white, but, you know, the answer almost always lies somewhere in between. It's nuanced. It's both black and white. It's gray. Um, But people's need for that kind of instant gratification for things to be wrapped up and resolved uh, sort of truncates and eliminates any kind of space for this, for not knowing. Mm. So what can we do here? So we got to wrap it up. I want to... uh... I love leaving with um, some, some takeaways and actionable items. And, you know, what can I tell you? I need to fast from some of my addictions, right? Yeah. And, and right away, I'm like, ah, oh, but today's not a good day for that. <laughs> well, what I would say is if you're um, unhappy in your life um, or you're struggling with depression or anxiety or insomnia, or difficulty concentrating or lack of joy, You might try something counterintuitive, which is instead of reaching for something to make yourself more comfortable or to reward yourself, Mm. try integrating in small doses things that are actually uncomfortable for you, that are inconvenient, that are hard, and do that incrementally, um, you know, over the course of days to months at the same time that you avoid those quick pleasures and see what that does to your hedonic set point. See whether or not just subjectively in your own life, Um, whether or not over time that works to actually make you feel better about yourself to reduce anxiety and depression. Um, It's a, it's just an experiment, you know, it's data collection, but Mm. I think it's a, it's a worthwhile one in this world where we're constantly being bombarded by feel good drugs and behaviors. So that's it. Okay. So today we all need to go do something hard, (laughs) right? Go make ourselves uncomfortable. We need to commit to a fast from our technology. I'm talking to all my viewers right now. This is what we're going to do. We're going to pick, we're going to pick three days over the holidays and we're not going to turn our phone off of airplane mode. Maybe you got to call family. How are we going to deal with this? Hmm. Okay. Uh, we got to come up with something there. Maybe social media strictly. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ambition for a three-day fast from technology. My family's coming to me. They'll be at my house. I don't need to call anybody. It's all good. Right. So I can do it. Uh, and the third thing is we need to get outside more. And we need to lead by example and get back to our roots because that's what we're built for, right? Is the trees, dirt, and rocks, and rivers. And it's so important. It's so important. So <sighs> this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for You're welcome. making yeah. the time. Yeah. My pleasure. Yep. Good conversation. And there's so many threads that are just like another whole hour of conversation. So, yeah. you know, there's always more to talk about. But uh, look, I, I really appreciate you coming on, getting in front of my audience, talking to me and, and let me hit you up with so many questions that I just 
trying to find clarity on. Um, yeah, so you, yeah. you and me and all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, have an awesome day and uh, I'd love to do it again sometime. Yeah. Right. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Jay. Okay, hey guys, three last things. First, if you enjoy my interviews and would like a bit more, you can subscribe to my Friday newsletter. It's free and the comment to subscribe is right beneath this video in that pinned comment. In this newsletter, I share my key lessons learned, takeaways, and any actions that I might be taking in the market as a consequence of what I've learned on the show. Second, when I started a YouTube channel, I never anticipated generating any advertising revenue. But coincidentally, I do now, which is awesome. And so what I've decided to do is donate this to an organization that is very close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Their mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by providing young people experiencing homelessness with supportive housing, employment, professional support, life skills, and outdoor adventure. Because often young people in urban centers with no resources will never get the opportunity to experience wild places, nature that can be so transformational and absolutely was for me. Third, if you prefer to listen to my content, you can now find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for The Jay Martin Show.